last time we were looking at the divergence theorem, which is going to be another way to evaluate a flux integral. So for the divergence theorem, again, we needed to review what the divergence of a vector field is. You know, that's, uh, that's it's essentially a measure of expansion or compression, depending on the, on the sign of, of of the value of the divergence, right? And then we also went back and evaluated, or not evaluated, right? Revisited the, uh, what's it called? The Green's theorem version two, the one that, that, that deals with, with the divergence, okay? Um, as a preliminary example, so we were looking at uh, the situation where we have a driving force given in the form of a force field, of a vector field, and the question is find the total flux across the, the, the tetrahedron right here, right? Well, so if we were to do this the way we did it in, uh, in section, what was that, 17.6, no, using the surface integrals, the flux integrals, we would have to set up four double flux integrals, which doesn't, doesn't seem like the most uh, efficient way to do it, you know? Again, if you want to um, verify this work, like uh, doing parameterizing the surfaces, like we, like we did it back in the, in the previous, uh, the previous uh, section, that was 70.6, that's fine, you should get the, the same result. But again, um, the sketch of the solution for that problem, for this problem, using that using that uh, that point of view, it's simply not the most efficient. So in this case, we're just going to use the divergence theorem. So because the divergence theorem, again, think of the of all those vectors that that are in explosion, right? In all directions in the surface, that is, in the that those are going to be considered in the direction across the diagonal plane and across the the other three coordinate axes, not a coordinate axis, the coordinate planes, right? So we won't have to evaluate uh, four uh, flux integrals. So simply using the divergence theorem. Well, we work example number one using the divergence theorem. Well, so that'll be okay. Find the divergence of the vector field F, which is the partial of M with respect X plus the partial of N with respect Y plus the partial of P with respect, with respect Z, okay? Now, uh, let's go back to our vector field right here. Okay, so let me see if I can put everything on the screen. There you go, right here, all right? Okay, so the partial of M with respect X, that's 2X, the, the, the partial of 2X, which is 2, plus the partial of N with respect Y, careful because we have a negative in the front, the derivative of 2Y is 2, but times the negative, that's a negative 2, and lastly, the partial derivative of P with respect Z, that's, a, that's 1. Right, is that a one or? Uh, oh no, it's two, two. I was looking at the second component, it's two. Well, actually this simplifies to the following. So these two reduce, cancel out, so the divergence is two, okay? So how do we use the divergence theorem to find the flux? So in the end, we are evaluating a double integral over the surface S of F dotted with big N. That is, we are evaluating all the derivative values that come from, uh, from the dot product of the force field in the direction of the normal, right? Not in the direction of motion, so in the direction of normal, in the direction of the expansion, rather, or, or compression, either way. And that's ds, okay? Big S. However, instead of setting up the flux integrals, we're going to use the divergence theorem. That is the triple integral over the region Q of the divergence of F, all right? DV. So we would be integrating uh, over a solid region. Remember, okay, so you can see the pattern. Remember how we evaluated line integrals, many methods, I mean, not many methods, many situations, and then we learned about, what was that? Green's theorem to evaluate a line integral instead 
by evaluating a double integral over a plane region. Okay, so now we're evaluating a surface integral by means of a triple integral in, in, in this space. And we can iterate this using the region, the solid region we have at the top here in, in the previous part. All right, so what is the divergence? Didn't we get two? So let me iterate dz, dy, dx, all right? Okay, so let's set up the limits of integration here. Um, okay, so the, the limits of integration in the direction of z, that is the lower limit, of course, I hope it's clear, the lower limit is zero because it's the xy plane, it's bounded below, the, the solid is bounded below by, uh, by, the, by the xy plane, which is z equals zero. However, it's bounded above by the equation of the plane and the equation of the plane, which is given by. So let me solve for z right here. That is 12 minus 3x minus 2y. And z equals to 6 minus 3 halves x minus y. So that will be our upper limit of integration here. Let me make some space. Okay. Uh-huh. So that's uh, 6 minus 3 halves x minus y. What about the, lo the limits of integration for the xy plane? Well, remember how we did this projection? And actually, we got this equation right here, the equation of the line. So that is, what was that, 4? That's 6. Well, the equation of this line is y equals to negative 6 over 4 because it has a negative slope, negative 6, negative 6 over 4, which reduces to negative 3 halves x, I mean negative 3 halves x plus the y-intercept, which is 6. And of course, the lower limit will be the horizontal line y equal to 0. Okay, so it's going to go between 0 and negative 3 halves x plus 6. And lastly, what about the limits of integration in the direction of x? What about them? Hmm? What is that again? 0 to 4, all right? Okay. So, I mean, we would, we would need to evaluate this triple integral. I mean, we would have to, what? Uh, okay, Eva evaluate with respect z, that's uh, the upper limit and the lower limit, and then with respect to y, that, that'll give us an integral with respect x. I mean, it's still gonna be a tedious integral, right? But at least this is gonna be a lot, lot better than evaluating four flux, separate flux integrals, right? Let me show you a trick. So, huh. because, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to evaluate this triple integral for real. I don't want to. I don't want to. So, how about we take advantage of geometry? So, we are integrating over which solid region? What's the shape of the solid region here? The triangle? No, it's not. Well, the triangle is the, it's the base of the solid, right? So what, what's the what's the solid region? How does that look like? Start with T. It starts with a T. All right. So tetrahedron. It's a tetrahedron. All right. Okay. How about we use the formula to find the volume of a tetrahedron? Do you know that one? You, uh, yeah. I. I I, I discovered this like not too long ago. I mean, I mean, of course there has to be, but I never used it. So let me take out the two times the volume of tetrahedron. All right, so how do we find the volume of a tetrahedron? Well, that's two times. Remember how we use uh, a lot of the area formulas in, in what's that, in Green's theorem? We're gonna, we may use some of the volume formulas in, in divergence theorem, why not? So. Uh, that'll be one third the area of the base times the height of the tetrahedron. Well, let's find the area first, okay? So that's two times uh, one third. What's the area of, what's that? The area of the, of, the, of the triangle. Okay, so area, that is one half times 
length times width, right? So the length, which is 4 times the width or the height, let me do little h for height because that's not the same height as the tetrahedron, okay? The height, which is 6, 6 times 4 equals to 24 over 2, area equals to 12, all right? Let me substitute that here. 12 times the height. What's the height of the of the pyramid, of the tetrahedron? So that's going to be given by the z-intercept. How many units is that? Isn't that six units? So that's that times six, right? Giving us a total of 48. Right? You don't have to evaluate the triple integral. I don't like that one. Mm -hmm. Right? Pretty cool, right? Okay, so pretty easy, I mean, pretty short way, very efficient way to solve this problem rather than going the old-fashioned way by setting up three, I mean, four flux integrals. But still, it's important to know how to set up a flux integral, where it's com where is it coming from, and how, it, and how does that relate to Stokes' theorem and also to the divergence, well, not the Stokes' theorem, the divergence theorem. All right, let's use the divergence theorem to evaluate the flux integral, all right? F and DS. Oh, okay, by the way, uh, you may see this normal vector either with lowercase n or uppercase n, either way, doesn't matter. It's just different notation, but in the end, it refers to the same thing. Those, um, we're adding all the projections of the normal vectors, uh, the normal projections of all these vector fields onto the onto the surface, right? Okay, so that's going to give us a total flux. So where S is given by this uh, vector value function, and S is a rectangular prism bounded by the coordinate planes. Well, what do we mean by coordinate planes? X equals zero, y equals zero, z equals zero. Just like the coordinate axis, x equals zero, y equals zero in in the two D plane. Okay, so let's plot the region of integration here. Or not the region, the solid of integration. So, mm -hmm. okay, so we're going to have this rectangular box here uh, with a, what's the height? Z equals to 4, so 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, I'll, X equals to 3, 1, 2, 3. And z and y equals to 2. 1, 2. So that is the rectangular box for which we're going to find the flux across. Now think about this problem. Think about this. Uh, how many planes create or are, or are required to create this box? Do you, we got, you guys agree it's six planes? Do you feel like evaluating six flux integrals, setting up six flux integrals? It's not the best way to solve this problem. So thanks to Gauss who came up to, came to who came up with this divergence theorem, we can evaluate this pretty much in a blink of an eye, right? I mean, unless the integral becomes a little more complicated or unless the full integral does not turn out being something like the, like the previous example where we could use the volume of the so, of, of some solid, you know. Okay, so the divergence. Let, oh, that's all we need to do. Find the divergence and iterate the triple integral, and then evaluate the triple integral. So the divergence of f, which is okay, the partial of m with respect x plus the partial of n with respect y plus the partial of p with respect z. Okay, so the partial of the quantity m, that's 2x. Oh, we're gonna have variables, so that means we will have to evaluate the triple integral. Okay, that's plus. Hmm. Uh, the derivative of n with respect y, that's actually minus 2. And the derivative of p with respect z, that's a plus 2. That equals, oh, cancel, cancel, 2x. So the flux across this rectangular prism will be, okay, number one, flux, which is the double integral over the surface S of F dotted with N dS, and that it's instead the triple integral of the divergence of F 
over the solid region Q, right? dB. And well, I mean, look at this triple integral. This triple integral is pretty easy to set up because the limits of integrate or the, the bounds of the solid are planes. How do we describe planes? Well, I mean, simpler planes like these are just going to be the the are given by the value that we're given x equals three, y equals two, and z equals to four. And well, the, by coordinate planes, I, we mean again uh, x equals zero, y equals zero, and z equals to zero. And I think it's pretty easy to see it from um, from the solid. So in the direction of x, zero to three. In the direction of y, zero to what's that? Two. And finally, in the direction of uh, z, from zero to four. The divergence, which is 2x, I'm going to iterate dz, dy, dx. Let me make some space here. All right. So, so evaluating this integral, well, let's integrate with respect z, right, with respect to z, that's going to give us the integral from 0 to 3 and from 0 to 2. So integrating with respect to z, that's going to give us 2xz evaluated between 0 and 4. But again, these limits of integration, 0 and 4, are for z, not for x, because we're integrating with respect x, okay? So let's keep going. That's equal to the integral from 0 to 3, from 0 to 2, and well, that's um, 2x times 4 minus 0, which is going to be uh -huh, just 4. So dy dx. And well, 4 minus 0, which is 4 times 2, that's going to give us a neg, which I'd rather write in front of the double integral. That's an 8. Integral from 0 to 3 and from 0 to 2, uh, x dy dx. Integrating x with respect to y, that's simply, so that's 8, the integral from 0 to 3, that's xy from 0 to 2. And again, the limits of integration are just going to be for the variable y because we integrate it with respect to y. Then, okay, there's a dx that equals 8 times the integral uh, of x times 2 minus 0 dx from 0 to 3, and 2 minus 0, which is y, that's 2, times 8, 2 times 8, that's 16. So that equals 16 times the integral from 0 to 3 of x dx. And well, the integral of x with respect x, um, that equals 16 x squared over 2 from 0 to 3. 16 over 2, isn't that equal to 8? And then times 3 squared minus 0 squared, where 3 squared, what's that? 9, 9 minus 0, that's 9 times 8, equals to 72, all right? And that's a lot quicker and a lot better than having to evaluate a total of 6, you know, 6 surface integrals, all right? You don't want to do that, all right? Okay, so let's have a look at the next example, see what we do, see what we get. Okay, find the outward flux of f of x, y, z equals to x, y squared, i plus x squared, y, j plus one third x, z cubed, k. Through the surface of the solid given by x squared plus y squared equals to 9. All right? That's all they're telling us. x squared plus y squared equals to 9. What does that represent, first of all? A sphere. What else? Sphere of what? Radius 3. Okay. So we're evaluating, we're going to set up a triple integral over a surface. What do you think we should, we're going to do here? Spherical coordinates, right? We're going to use spherical coordinates. Well, number one, let's find the divergence of the, of the vector field. Okay, again, this is M, this is N, and this is P. So the divergence of F, that equals, again, partial of m with respect x plus partial of n with respect to y plus partial of p with respect z, which is going to be, okay, partial of m with respect x, that's 1 times y squared plus 
partial of n with respect to y, that's 1 times x squared, which is x squared, plus partial of p with respect to z, that's 3 times 1 third z squared, which reduces to, uh, I'm going to write this in alphabetic order, x squared plus y squared plus z squared, right? And, well, what is this going to be? Okay, let's evaluate, um, let's set up the, the flux integral first, okay? So that's the surface integral, S of F dotted with N, the normal vector, which is instead the triple integral over the region Q of the divergence of F dV, all right? All right, so uh, we don't have to even bother uh, writing a rectangular, a rectangular equation because why? If we're going to go straight to spherical coordinates, I mean, you would have to, to solve for z right here for the equation of the, of the surface and get two radicals, a lower and upper radical, and then do the projection onto the xy plane for two other radicals, and then for the limits of the outermost limits of integration, that's going to be negative 3 to positive 3. But it's not worth the effort because we will just go and calculate this using spherical coordinates. Unless you are otherwise expected to write the rectangular integral first, which I don't think it's going to be, you know, I don't think it's going to happen. Just because ju we just want to know the result here. Well, so that is the triple integral over the solid Q, all right? of the divergence, which is x squared plus y squared plus z squared dv, okay? So, all right, uh, what do you say we we, uh, we change this to spherical coordinates, right? Okay, so what is x squared plus y squared plus z squared in spherical? Row squared, Row squared right? Row squared. What about dv? What do we re replace this with? Rho squared sine phi. Rho squared sine phi. Uh huh. What else? D rho. D rho. D phi. D theta. We're good to go. All right. So let's write down the integral. Mm -hmm. That's a triple integral of rho squared. Careful because this rho squared is from the the, the, the divergence we got from before. Now, there's going to be another rho squared from the differential of volume. That is, okay, uh, rho squared is the same. Rho squared uh, sine phi d rho d phi d theta. Okay, inner limits of integration, the limits for rho, what are going to be those limits? 0 to 3 because that's the radius of the sphere. Okay, 0 to 3. What about the limits for phi? That's the azimuthal angle. In other words, that's the angle that takes uh, the, the angular distance that takes us from the North Pole to the South Pole. Zero to pi. Zero to pi. All right, zero to pi. Well, why is that zero to pi? Because they're not telling us any additional conditions like the upper hemisphere, for instance, you know, or the first octant only. No, so. It's the entire surface, 0 to pi. What about the polar angle, the round angle? 0 to pi. Again, we don't have any additional conditions that state otherwise. So, oh, wait, wait, wait. 0 to 2 pi. That means the integral from 0 to 2 pi, 0 to pi, and 0 to 3. Rho to the fourth, sine phi, d rho, d phi, d theta. And let's evaluate this integral. I think it's way easier to evaluate this integral rather than the rectangular we would have come with, right? So, let's see. Uh, so that's the integral with respect to rho, that's from zero to two pi, from zero to, um, from zero to pi, and that's rho to the fifth over five from zero to three. Don't forget the sine phi, d rho, I mean d phi, d theta. And I'm going to take the one-fifth outside. One-fifth and I'm going to have 
3 to the 5th power minus 0 to the 5th power sine phi d phi d theta. Okay, and okay, 3 to the 5th power, well, that's 3 to the 4 is 81 times 3. Is that uh, 243? 243. And I'm going to write this 243 outside of the integral and multiply with the 1 fifth. 0 to 2 pi, 0 to pi, sine phi, d phi, d theta. Okay? And from here, okay, the integral of sine, negative cosine, careful, that equals negative 243 over 5, integral from 0 to 2 pi, cosine phi, evaluated between 0 and pi, d theta. Okay, that means, number 1, negative 243 over 5, integral from 0 to 2 pi, that's cosine pi minus cosine zero d theta. What's cosine pi? Again, is that negative one? Okay. And cosine zero, that's a one. Be careful, negative one minus one, isn't that equal to negative two? So this is negative two negative 2 times the negative from the outside, that's 243 times 2 over 5, which I will actually multiply this, that's 486 over 5, integral from 0 to 2 pi of d theta. That equals, what's that, 486 over 5, theta from 0 to 2 pi, which is 486 over 5 times 2 pi minus 0 and we'll just multiply this for 86 by 2 to get 972 pi over 5 right. so that is our um, that is our our um, our flux across the sphere okay using the divergence theorem okay so let's see all right, let's have a look at, what's that? Okay, one more example, the divergence of a rotational field. Okay, before we even go about this, ex this exercise, can you anticipate the result we're going to obtain for this? Without doing any calculations. What does the physics we described er in the earlier section tell us about this? Zero flux. Zero flux? Why? Why is it zero flux? Mm -hmm. For the base of the circle. What is that? For the circle around the bottom. For the circle about the bottom. Mm -hmm. I mean, the zero flux is correct, but that's not the reason for that. Okay, let's see. Let's get other ideas. What do you guys think? Yes. Because it's inside? What am I saying? Oh, I hear you. Okay, so in this case, that z less than or equal to zero, it's telling us we are going to consider this time only the lower hemisphere, right? So that doesn't have anything to do with the zero. So because flux can can go across the lower hemisphere or the upper hemisphere, like in the previous case, right? We had a hemisphere of radius three. But why is uh, what does the rotational field have to do with a divergence equal to zero? That's a question here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
any other ideas? Yes? Exactly that, because what does a rotational field do? It just goes around, causes rotation. Those vectors go in the direction of motion only, you know, as opposed to um, the radial vector field, which is comprised by a bunch of vectors that go either in an expansion direction or a compression direction. Recall that a force field is broken up into two components. So each vector in, on a vector field, number one, can project a shadow in the direction of motion, which will cause uh, a rotation or will, or will, and will uh, project uh, a shadow or yeah, a shadow in the direction normal to the surface or to the curve we're integrating over, right? So, and well, that normal, that has to do with the divergence. And if we have a, a vector field that it's purely rotational, it's 100% rotational, it's 0% uh, expansion compression, right? So that's why we should get a zero for this, uh, for this situation. Well, let's verify this. Well, uh, in general, um, a, a rotational field is given by some vector A times another variable vector, which, by the way, A is not an acceleration vector, just so you guys don't get confused about it. Uh, it's just a constant vector, you know, it's only a constant vector uh, times uh, v via cross product um, a, any, a variable vector of the form x, y, z, right? So we're going to use the divergence theorem for that vector field over the surface x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals to 16, but in this case, this, this additional uh, this additional condition tells us that we will only consider the lower part of the, of the sphere, that is the lower hemisphere, okay? So, and with its base on the xy plane, which is bounded above by the plane z equals to zero, okay? So, find the net outward flux across the surface, I mean, yeah, the divergence here. Right? Okay, so, what about f? So, because f it's not given as a regular vector field, as a force field. We're given this, this field in the form of a cross product. Let's take care of that cross product, all right? That is um, uh, F, which is vector A cross with vector R. That is I, J, K. That is one, two, three, X, Y, Z. Okay, so let's do the cross product between these two vectors, okay. So, that is going to be i times, okay, that is 2z minus 3y. I'm going to do the cofactors this time, not the repeating the columns. And then minus something in the direction of j, so that is 1 times z, oh wait, Minus, yeah, 1 times z, yeah, that's fine. Simply going to be 3x minus z and plus y minus 2x in the direction of k. And, well, let me change to component form. It would be easier, I think, 2x, uh, 2z minus 3y, comma. Uh, well, actually, no, 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 no. This was supposed to be z minus 3x, which changes to 3x minus z. And lastly, y minus 2x, okay? Because we need to find the divergence of this vector field, okay? So again, this is m, this is n, and this is p. Find the divergence. The divergence of f that equals, again, the partial of m with respect x plus the partial of n with respect y plus the partial of p with respect z. All right. And what is this? Okay, partial of m with respect x. Okay, that's zero because there is no excess in the m component. Plus the partial of n with respect y, that's also zero because there's no y's in the y component. Plus the partial of p with respect z, that's also zero because there's no this in the p component so final answer the divergence equals to zero okay so let's set up the, the double integral that calculates the flux across the solid okay 
S F dotted with N dS that equals the triple integral of the divergence of F over the solid region Q, where the solid region Q, well, actually, we don't, we won't even need to iterate the triple integral because the divergence equals to zero, and the integral of zero, that's going to give us zero divergence, right? As we expected, as we anticipated, right? Because the vector field, again, is purely rotational. There's not, because of the rotation, there's nothing going out. All right, there's nothing going out. Um, all right, so that's going to take us to the to the next theorem. So pure outward rotation fields of the form f a cross f, or a cross r, where a is a constant vector and r it's a variable vector of the form x y z, have zero divergence. Thus, it has zero net outward flux. All right. Uh, I mean, think about it when uh, when you're cooking, for instance. For those of you who like cooking, when you're preparing, say, a sauce or something, and you're mixing the ingredients, if, if you, your your arm actually is working as a vector field, if, if you're mixing the ingredients correctly, if you if nothing spills out of the pan, for instance, that means your arm is working as a perfect rotational field. If you spill something, then you have what do you have? You have rotation. Right? You have curl, you have projection on, yeah, you have, yeah, rotation, but you also have some outward flux, you know? So there's divergence and rotation, which means you need to be more careful, right? And you want to do only rotation. So that's one way to see this idea. And to wrap up the, the course, let's have a look at a final perspective. What have we been doing the entire, or for, during this three semester? Calculus one. The fundamental theorem of calculus. So what did you, what did you learn back then? Uh, you learned that the integral of some of the derivative of some function, you retrieve the original function, you integrate between a and b to find the area under the curve. All right? Uh, but well, what is that going to give? What it, where do we integrate? So we're really integrating over an interval. So you learn the one-dimensional version of the addition of these differential values or derivative values. Number two, uh, fundamental theorem of line integrals. That's still, in a way, a one-dimensional because it involves only a single integral. All right, and well, we integrated over a parameterized curve from point A to point B, etc. And then Green's theorem, that's a circulation form. Then you know there's the other version, the, the flux form, but we just look at the Green's, um, I mean, at the circulation form. But why, where do we integrate it? Now here is where we increase the dimension. So we, we integrate it over a planar region, over a two dimensional region. So finally, both. Stokes' and divergence theorem, well, yeah, well, the, the Stokes' theorem, yeah, that's still over over some surface, or over a surface, yeah, that it's, it's still 3D somehow, but we make the changes to make it a double integral. Remember when we have that extra variable, we need to write it in terms of, uh, of the two differential values. And lastly, for the divergence theorem, we integrate over what? A solid region. So... All we did is increase the dimension, increase the dimension. But in the end, integration is about adding infinitely many differential values. That's all it is. That's all it is. Of course, we use all these different integrals to, to calculate certain quantities, to, to do some, some um, what's it called, some, a lot of applications, calculating volumes, calculating areas, calculating mass of plane of laminate, calculating mass of solids, calculating, what did we do, flux, calculating circulation, calculating, yeah, uh, yeah again, uh, the flux across. But in the end, what's, it, what's all this about? Adding infinitely many different infinitely many differential values. And this is the end. This is how Cal3 ends. All right. Huh.